Hello everyone, this is Dr. Hammond, continuing on for lecture notes, uh, with lecture notes for relativistic mechanics um, for physics 3210 at the University of Windsor uh, for the lecture that would have been taking place on Thursday, March 26th. All right, so now we're going to be talking about relativistic mechanics. I started to cover this last lecture. Um, so we need to talk about uh, proper time because we'll be using that for the rest of this lecture. So proper time um, will act just like we saw time dilation before. So this rate of time in this moving frame is related to our stationary frame um, by the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. So in this case, we're going to have proper time, and that will we'll call proper time tau, and that will be related to uh, stationary time as 1 minus u squared over c squared. Um, so we use u instead of v because the textbook changes this. Um, later on, I'll show you a problem where we have uh, the difference between u and v, um, and so that's why we have this no this change in notation to u. Um, so proper time is the time that the object um, <clears throat> uh, moving with velocity u feels. So proper time is the time of the moving object. So say if you're in a car and I'm stationary at the side of the road and you're driving by, um, you would be measuring your time by the proper time. Um, and so that's yeah, that's the, the time that a watch, the person who's moving around. Uh, ticks by. So you have a watch in your car that's you know driving by me. Uh, so your watch is clicking is uh, you know counting proper time. So this leads to kind of an interesting uh, idea that um, ends up simplifying a lot of the math, and so that's why we'll be using it. But it's a little strange to start. Um, the velocity that I see you as you're driving by. So I see you know you travel down a road. Um, you go. I don't know, say one kilometer in one minute uh, to give you 60 kilometers an hour. Um, I, I see you move one kilometer and I time it by my watch as one minute. Um, and that gives you this ordinary velocity of 60 kilometers an hour or one kilometer per minute. Um, you, of course, would be seeing a slightly different length and a slightly different time. Um, and, but the thing is, is that you would have the same velocity relative to me. So it wouldn't matter if I'm moving or you're moving, we're both seeing that this relative velocity is going to 60 kilometers an hour. So instead we introduce this kind of strange notation um, called the proper velocity. And this proper velocity is I measure the distance of the track. So I say that it's 60 kilometers, but you say that it takes, instead of one minute, it takes, I don't know, half a minute or something like that. Um, and so it's the proper velocity is the length that I say that you've traveled versus the time that you said that you've taken. And this is, this is kind of strange, it's kind of abstract to start, but we'll understand quickly uh, why it's so useful. And this is called the proper velocity. Um, I know it's kind of strange because um, when we talk about the velocity of a stationary vers observer versus a, um, a moving observer, uh, obviously, the only thing that we should be agreeing on, we shouldn't be agreeing on how far you traveled, we shouldn't be agreeing on how, um, you know, the time it took you to travel that distance, but we should agree on uh, the, the velocity that you were going at, because um, that's going to be just relative to one another. Um, and so we've introduced this proper velocity, which actually, um, you know, we wouldn't agree on, because you would be having a different time, and I would have a different length measurement. Uh, but, um, so, so just kind of think about, um, you know, that that's kind of weird, um, but we'll be using it. And the reason we'll be using it is because uh, we can easily transform from one frame to the other um, in very simplified notation. So uh, the proper velocity will be related to the ordinary velocity. Um, so the proper velocity is given by eta, um, and it's just equal to gamma times u, the ordinary velocity where gamma is this usual Lorentz factor, this 1 over 1 minus u squared over c squared. So uh, then if we, if we continue with that, then um, the proper velocity component will be the derivative of each component with respect to this uh, proper time. 
Um, and the zeroth component will be the respect of uh, the derivative of ct with respect to c uh, with respect to tau, um, and so that's c dt by d tau, which gives us gamma c. And so that means that all four components will be related to the other one just by a uh, gamma factor. And so because everything's just related by um, by a gamma factor, we can convert these proper velocities from a moving frame into a stationary frame um, simply by these this simple notation of uh, Lorentz transformations. And this is actually exactly like what we had for the Lorentz transformations for uh, position. So we had x bar is equal to gamma x naught minus uh, beta x1. x bar 1 is equal to gamma x1 minus beta uh, x0. And then, of course, the y components are the same and the z components are the same. Uh, so that's the nice thing about using proper velo velocities is that now our velocities transform in the exact same way um, as our positions in the Lorentz transformation. Um, and so you can see, compare that to the uh, Einstein velocity addition rule, um, which in the same direction, this becomes u minus v, or ux minus v minus, or over 1 minus ux v over c squared, um, which looks uh, quite different from position. And then when we have u, y, and u, z, we actually, actually, we actually have to worry about the ui component, the ux component, and the velocity difference of the two frames. So this becomes... Uh, um, kind of uh, cumbersome notation, um, especially if we're going from one frame to another frame to another frame. Um, so this is yeah. So this is the reason why we use this uh, proper velocity, and it also has uh, more implications when we start to talk about momentum. Uh, but first, I will go through an example. So in problem twelve twenty five, we have a car that's traveling along the forty five degree line in frame S. So that's this frame here in the x y coordinates. Um, at ordinary speed, uh, 2 over root 5c. So the first question is find the components of ux and ui in the ordinary velocity. Well, there's actually a typo in the textbook. He says that both ux and ui are u cos 45. Technically, cos 45 degrees is equal to sine 45, which are both 1 over root 2. But, um, but ux component is u cos 45, ui component is u sine 45. So uh, make a note of that. Um, and we get that uh, the ux component, it'll be 2 fifths c, and the ui component will also be 2 fifths c, of course. Um, so it says, uh, find the components of the proper velocity in the x and y direction. So now that we found ux and ui, we just multiply those by gamma to get our proper velocity. And so we have root 2 over 5. And then uh, times gamma, where gamma is 1 over 1 minus, or the square root of 1 minus 4 fifths, um, because it's it's going to be uh, 2 over root 5 squared, so that's 4 fifths. So that gives us root 5 times square root of 2 fifths, so that gives us root 2c. So our proper velocity here is actually greater than the speed of light. It's kind of strange. Um, but that kind of makes sense because if we look at how uh, proper velocity is defined all the way back here, um, we can have this length, or sorry, we can have this length, but then we can have this time can be shorter than uh, what it uh, ought to be. And so that means that this proper velocity can be greater than the speed of light. Uh, and so for uh, eta x, this proper velocity in x will be root 2c, this proper velocity in y will also be root 2c. Uh, find the zeroth component, so uh, just the you know the the c component, but we know that that's just gamma times c, and we had that gamma is the square root of five, and so we just get that this component is square root of five times c. Okay, so now they've in, he's introduced another frame of reference where we have this s bar, and this s bar is moving in the x direction with an ordinary speed of root two two fifths c relative to s. So we have this car driving root or 2 over root 5c at 45 degrees in S. And then we have this other frame where this thing's you know, whipping by um, in the S frame, S bar frame at root 2 over 5c. Uh, so now we have to transform to find ux bar and uy bar. So ux bar, it's going to be 
ux minus v over 1 minus ux v over c squared. We put that in and you get root 2, five, root two over 5 minus root 2 times uh, 2 over 5 and uh, that should give us 0, although I think that might be a typo. That might be uh, divided by root 2 uh, to give us 0. Um, whereas in UI, what you get is uh, it's divided by gamma. And so divided by gamma, it gives you the square root of 1 minus 2 fifths. And then we have, so that gives us, uh, and then times uh, 2 fifths C, and then 1 minus uh, square root of 2 fifths C times 2 over root 5 times 1 over root 2. Yeah, so this should be 1 over root 2, just like here should be 1 over 2, and then C squared. And so what we get is um, uh, root 2 over 3c. Uh, now, for part e, he asks, we'll find the proper velocity components, um, eta x bar and eta y bar in s bar. So now we have to transform, um, but we know how to do that easily with this proper velocity. Um, and so again, we get that uh, eta x bar is 0, but eta y bar is equal to eta y. And we've already calculated eta y to be root 2c, so it's just root 2c. And f, as a consistency check, verify that we can see that eta bar is equal to u bar uh, times, I guess, gamma bar, since that's the square root of 1 minus u squared, or u bar squared over c squared. So uh, we get the three components. The three vector is um, eta bar vector is equal to u bar vector divided by 1 or the square root of 1 minus u bar squared over c squared. Um, but um, ux bar is going to be 0, since we calculated that here is 0. Uh, there's actually a typo here. Uh, I think he divides by gamma, but it should be multiplied by gamma. But it doesn't matter. Um, but there are, yeah, there are a few typos. I mean, as I said, there's a typo in my solution here that this should be 1 over 2c. Uh, but there are actually some typos in, his solution, in the solutions manual as well. Uh, but we find um, uh, eta y bar um, is equal to root 2c. And that's exactly what we found over here, that is root 2c. So this is just a little example of how to, uh, of practicing um, going from one frame to the other using this proper uh, velocity notation. So uh, I don't recommend going over this just to kind of familiarize yourself with it, um, because it can get a little tricky. All right, so uh, I think I had this in the last uh, uh, set of notes as well, but I'll just go over it again. So what does this four vector dot product look like? Um, so just as we saw before, for, and our rotation, if we have some vector that has some length r uh, and we rotate our coordinate system, it doesn't actually change. This length doesn't actually change in three dimensions. Um, in the same way, this proper velocity dot product uh, also doesn't change under a Lorentz transformation. So the dot product, the four vector dot product is just negative c squared. And since nothing, uh, since the speed of light is invariant in any uh, frame of reference as Einstein postulated, then that means that this four vector dot product is also invariant it's just minus c squared, uh, which is kind of neat. Um, Okay, so now let's actually use this. So the relativistic or this proper velocity um, is useful because we can uh, simplify the math for these Lorentz transformations, but it actually has more, uh, we can actually get more physical insight from this uh, proper velocity by multiplying it by the mass of an object. So mass times velocity is of course momentum, and we'll do the exact same thing here. So rel this relativistic momentum, um, which, seems like it should be called the proper momentum since it's the proper velocity times the times the mass. But anyways, he calls it the relativistic momentum. It's just the mass times this proper velocity. And so we get mu over the square root of 1 minus u squared over c squared, or gamma mu. Uh, so that means that this four vector, we'll just call this uh, uh, p mu, the contravariant four vector. Um, of p is m times this contravariant vector of the proper velocity. Um, so now we want to look at the zeroth component of this that we get um, 
the zero the zeroth component, of course, is going to be the zeroth component of the proper velocity times mass, which is just going to be mc over the square root of 1 minus u squared over c squared, or gamma mc. Um, so since c, as we said, is constant, um, historically people have been calling this uh, gamma m as the relativistic mass, so m relativistic is, is gamma m here. Uh, but the textbook says, it says that this has kind of fallen out of fashion. Um, it seems like an introductory textbook, so maybe in like your, you know, the massive tome that you guys get uh, for first and second year physics, um, you have these really, really large textbooks uh, that might have some relativity, relativistic um, concepts in there. Um, I think they'll probably still talk about this relativistic mass, uh, but it turns out that uh, relativistic mass is just the same as uh, the relativistic energy um, and the difference is just a factor of c squared, and so it seems like people talk about relativistic energy instead of relativistic mass, but basically they're saying the same thing. Um, okay, so now speaking of relativistic energy, um, since we found that the uh, scalar product of the four vector of velocity um, is just negative c squared, if we, we want to find this um, scalar product of the relativistic momentum, of course, that's just going to be negative c squared times m squared. Uh, so we get negative mc squared. And this is, of course, also invariant um, because this is the mass that's measured in its own frame. Um, but note that if we think about, if we use this, we think about the zeroth component, then we get mc over the square root of 1 minus u squared over c squared. Um, but this is just going to be mc, and then for very slow velocities, 1 plus u squared over 2c squared. But we know that energy from Newtonian mechanics, or I mean, even from non relativistic Lagrangian mechanics, that um, the energy is 1 half mv squared. Um, so that means that we can actually see that this gets 1 half mu squared, and then um, this, is, this is going to be divided by c. And so what we'll say is if we have this zeroth momentum times c is equal to is going to be equal to this energy, and then what's left behind is this mc squared. So what we get is the form, form momentum is the uh, third, like the three dimension of momentum, and then the zeroth component is energy divided by c, um, and that zeroth, you know, that zeroth component is mc squared divided by c, so it's just mc uh, or gamma, sorry, gamma mc, I should say. Um, and just for completeness, uh, we see that e squared minus p squared c squared is equal to m squared c to the fourth. Um, although this seems kind of strange when we've just said that e is equal to gamma mc squared, it turns out that if you think about what a photon is doing, um, the mass is zero, but its velocity is c. Um, and so that doesn't work out very well. Um, but you can, um, uh, instead using this formula, uh, you have E is going to be equal to uh, PC. So for a photon where M is equal to zero, you have the energy is just equal to um, the momentum times the speed of light. Uh, this will become important when we start talking about quantum mechanics because a momentum of particles you'll see is proportional to its wavelength or it's inversely proportional to its wavelength, I should say. Um, and this is kind of what all ties that together. All right, so now we're gonna finish up with uh, this relativistic mechanics by talking about some dynamics. So normally in force in three dimensions, we have that the, the force is the rate of change of momentum with respect to time. Um, that's kind of the you know formal definition of force. So we're going to work with this in four dimensions and call it the Minkowski force. Um, for some reason, instead of using F, they use K. Eventually we get to tensors. We'll use the tensor notation as an F. So I think that's why he uses K in this textbook. Um, I think it's also fairly common. But this Minkowski force, this, this contravariant Minkowski uh, four vector, is going to be the rate of change of this um, um, relativistic momentum with respect to tau. So instead of with respect to ordinary time, it's with respect to the proper time. 
Um, and so again, the zeroth component will be the zeroth component of the momentum with respect, uh, derivative of the zeroth component of the momentum with respect to the proper time as well. And that gives us the one over c times the power delivered to the object. So this is this zeroth component um, is going to be related to the energy as well. Um, and for the vector components, the Minkowski force is just equal to gamma f, uh, where f is the ordinary force. So it's kind of interesting that um, we look at, at um, the, the four vector of momentum is the three vector part and the zeroth component is just energy divided by C. Uh, the um, four vector of force is just the three vector you know, times gamma. Um, and the zeroth component is actually the, the proper power delivered. Um, and so it's, it's a kind of interesting that we've always thought of, you know, momentum and energy as uh, slightly different, but it actually turns out that energy is just going to be the zeroth component um, of this four vector, just like what we had with uh, spatial coordinates. So we had x, y, z, that we had the zeroth component, and so that's time. And so time is a scalar, whereas um, the other three components are vectors. Uh, but it turns out that in this four vector that we just uh, take the scalar part um, and put that in the zeroth component, um, which turns out to be really useful. And we'll see that in the when we talk about relativistic electrodynamics that we'll actually be doing that with our um, uh, vector potential and scalar potential as well. All right, so that is it for uh, relativistic mechanics. On the next lecture, I'll be talking about relativistic dynamics.